Well, welcome, Ryan the Lion, buddy. I'm so excited to have you as a return guest, my man. Um, thank you for coming on the Ridiculously Human podcast, bud. Oh, Gareth, um, <laughs> I'm super excited. I've been thinking about this for the last uh, couple of weeks, actually. And um, yeah, thank you so much for having me back. Really yeah. exciting. It's been, what, I think five years since we last spoke on this uh, platform. Yeah. With you and uh, Craig. And yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot happens in five years. Yeah, yeah, but tell me about it, especially in the world. The world's been turned upside down, but but um, I was just kind of wondering, like, do you get nervous for this sort of thing at all? Yeah, for sure. But it's like a it's like an excited nervousness, you know. It's not like a panic. It's more like uh, getting ready for a game. Yeah, exactly. Because because I find that like I get more nervous for this conversation with you as my buddy. Than I do with like say other guys that uh that that maybe I don't really know, and I think it's I don't know it's almost like this expectation, and I've got to like I don't know just be like really here for you, you know, and put on like a good show. <laughs> so it's a I feel this nervousness, but it's it's a good nervousness, you know what I mean? Well, thank you, brother, and I know your beautiful journey of you know overcoming your fears of public speaking and putting yourself out there. So I just you know just quickly to have seen you re up and get back into this is such a gift and um you can see it you're doing exactly what you need to be doing so thank you for doing it yeah no pleasure but that means a lot to me so so thanks a lot for that uh, so i was looking at your instagram and uh, last night you went uh, to this full moon meditation like on the beach there I'm, I'm assuming it's like south beach in miami um it just looks like such an, a magical experience but full moons have become like my monthly I don't know, it's like a sacrosanct experience. And here in South, in, in Miami in particular, the whole like spiritual world is really taking off. There's lots of amazing communities and people doing some amazing stuff. But there's a group that needs these meditations. And last night, there must have been, no jokes, about 500 people. That video that I took was like right in the beginning before everybody arrived. And by the end of it, that like whole section of the beach was packed. And to be led through a meditation and breath work and a little bit of yoga, just with that group consciousness happening, it's it's mind blowing, but that gives you feel for the whole month. Yes, it just looks like such a cool vibe, but um, I, I mean, that it feels like this amazing community. You know, I don't know like how many of the people know each other. If if most people are just kind of strangers, but it just seems like such a cool thing to do with uh, with so many people. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And last time we were saying actually with our friends, like just. I don't think it happens in many places around the world, although there is a lot more of it happening, but just, you know, to have this access to this kind of event is really, um, you're really lucky to have it. So next time, next time, when you do eventually travel to the US, brother, you're going to be dropping in with us on a full moon. Yeah, absolutely, but I definitely want to experience that, man. Uh, so, so I was thinking, but um, there's like we, two of us here, like old school buddies, you know, from, from high school, both with kind of long hair, uh, both kind of hippie vibes, um, you know, <laughs> uh, kind of, are we having a midlife crisis, man? Yes, <laughs> definitely. There's been a midlife crisis happening. And um, wow, we were actually talking about this yesterday with some friends, you know, you, you hit your 40s and um, depending on what stage in your life and what you've done or haven't done, different things start to come up for you. Um, for me, it's been around like, you know, not yet having a family. Um, I've spent the last 20 odd years really being on an adventure and traveling and dipping in and out of things that I've wanted to explore and do. And I've really embraced and loved my freedom. Um, but then there's a part of you that also like starts to look around and you go, wow, you know, do I want a family? Would I like to have kids? Do I want to be a bit more, you know, anchored? And so you start to also ask yourself these questions. What is it? What is your programming? What have you been given as what you should be doing with your life? And then what is your soul's calling? What does your heart want to do? Um, and in that happens moments of friction. And then you start doing things or changing things or just sitting in a bit of a funk trying to figure it all out. Uh, so which one do you find yourself in at the moment? Are you like figuring it out? Do you know what you kind of want? What is your soul saying? <laughs> Well, I think I've come to the understanding that life, you spend your whole life figuring things out, right? 
So it's just being patient with yourself and starting to know, you know, your journey is your journey and everybody's is so unique and so beautiful. And so I've, I've learned that the real solve is to focus on what you have and to stay in that moment of gratitude instead of looking around and, you know, worrying about the things you don't have. And as soon as you can switch that function, suddenly life, you know, lights up again for you and you can stay in the, the mode of appreciation and, uh, instead of lack, really, which is what it's about, you know. So no, right now I'm feeling super rich in all aspects of my life, in community, in adventure, in travel, in freedom, in my health, in my body, in my careers. And um, so no, right now, as you catch me, I'm in a really good space. So thank you. That's awesome. But so, so what are some things about long hair that you, you never realized um, that you now realize because <laughs> you have long hair? Yeah. So, yeah, so this is an interesting one, right? It was uh, looking at myself one day and going, you know what, I've never, ever actually grown my hair fully out. And so COVID was a perfect sort of timeline to allow you to start to grow your hair because, you know, you weren't worried about looking neat to come to the office every day and, you know, look a certain way because you wear a suit. And, um, and I was like, this is a great time to grow my hair. And then you start to realize that, I think in a lot of cultures, men, as they got older, started to grow their hair almost as like a symbol of age and wisdom. And so I've sort of been playing with that idea, you know, like I'm in my 40s now, I'm starting to step up into the archetype of sort of an older, um, becoming like, you know, a strong man in the community. And part of that is feeling it and showing it with, with some, some growth in the hair. And I was dating a... A beautiful hairstylist not long ago and she was explaining this how much energy you carry in your hair you know so all your experiences start to layer up in your hair and so it carries power and energy and you know part of that is all the learnings and the wisdom that you take on through through the days and the years as we go on and then it's also you feel that because when people go through big like changes in their life, what do they often do? They often end up cutting their hair off. They have a bad breakup. You know, girls cut their hair short. So it's almost like an opportunity to let go of some energy that it collects. So it's an energetic, it's an energetic force. And then some of my friends have lost all their hair. So I'm like, well, while I've got it, I'm going to make the most of it. Uh, it's classic but then there's always those oaks that don't have hair that give you grief hey eh? they're like oh yeah you know and you're like okay but yeah you've got none i know why you're doing it so, <laughs> just a quick question what was it for you that sort of sparked you on yeah but um i think it's almost the exact same thing like you said you know it's like this this sort of sign of like aging but like in a strong way you know what I mean? You, I, I don't know, you know, you think of some stories like um, from say the Bible or something, you know, with Samson and like how he had, it was Samson. Hey, he had the long Samson hair, didn't he? Yeah. Exactly. And um, you know, I don't know. It's, it's just, I also think it's a bit of a trend, you know, and maybe like the, the guys that I sort of started say following and stuff like that, I, that I kind of looked up to as kind of strong men I kind of also noticed, oh, these guys have like long hair and that sort of thing, you know, and maybe subconsciously I was like, well, it's a flipping good, good time to do it, you know, um, um, let's just do it. So I think, I think there's definitely something in there with what you said. So, um, so yeah, but one thing I've noticed, but uh, like long hair is, is um, hot. I don't know if you, <laughs> it, I have to like tie it up in the evening when I sleep because I'll wake up in the, in the middle of the night and I'm like sweating and I'm like, Yes, and it's mostly around my neck, and then it just goes around the rest of my body. And I'm like, yes, see, this long hair is hot, but <laughs> but for me, the, the the biggest challenge has been all the hair that I shed all over the house. But in the same, I'm like, what is going on? I'm surprised I've got any hair left on my head. I, I'm shocked as well, but I mean, I brush my hair all the time, and I look at my like brush or my comb, and I'm like. Yeah, see, you know, how's my hair still st still like? How have I still got hair on my head <laughs> with all this stuff that comes off? <laughs> uh, classic, but um, what do you think is going to be the catalyst for you to ultimately cut it? Have you thought about that at all? <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. My friend asked me yesterday, "Is like, are you ever going to cut your hair again?" And I was like, uh, uh, I thought I was going to, but now that you mention it, it's like, um, 
I don't know, but I think it's going to be just one of those things. You know, you wake up in the morning and you feel inspired and it's time for a change. And then suddenly, uh, you know, it's, okay, it's time to, to take it off. But I want to play with it for a little bit. You know, I want to take it to different lengths. I want to try different styles. I'm just learning how to take care of it. Like I'm still, I'm like a baby, right? Like I still don't know how to look after my long hair. You know, it's the first time I've had it. So it's like building a relationship. Uh, absolutely but uh, marissa had to tell me how to brush my hair like literally this week she's like you know if you've got knots you you need to start brushing it from the bottom i'm like oh okay cool <laughs> so <laughs> that's what you need to do in case you didn't know that but <laughs> no, no, it's uh, fun. it is fun it is funny eh? so um many years ago but uh you you told me about this one guy that you met um, and he said uh, you must write down a list of 100 things that you kind of want to do in your life and um, I was kind of wondering, like, do you still have that list that you wrote down? Um, and do you ever kind of refer back to it? Is there anything that you might have added or, you know, that you're doing now that you didn't expect? Well, but yeah, that's a, that's a great exercise. So the, the person that recommended that was actually Jim Rohn, right? And I know you've listened to some of this stuff as well. But anyway, it was the, it's called the stretchy list. And so you start down, like, all the things you want to do, have, experience, and the exercise is interesting because you can get to the first 10 super easy, right? When you get to 20, it's like, okay, cool. And then you get to 25, 30 and you're like, okay, now suddenly all the things that I know I can achieve and have and do and, you know, with a little bit of work can get there. Now suddenly you're thinking, okay, so what else is there? It's like, oof, that could, you know, can I do that? Is that possible? <laughs> and so it really helps you to sort of stretch the mind and stretch your you're thinking about what is possible for your life. So I've actually rewritten that list a few times over the last, you know, maybe 15, 15, 17 years. Um, I need to go find my book. I've got one of my one of my journals here that has that list. I'm gonna go and relook at it. But I can tell you now that one of them that comes to mind is is to go to Egypt. And and this will segue into another story that we probably want to share today, which is um, which is about Egypt and and our trip to Peru. But um, I've just booked actually a trip to Egypt for November. So I'm going to be ticking that off finally. Um, there was one also about like going back to Mauritius. And I ended up doing that, you know, just happenstance, got invited by a girlfriend's family and ended up going. And then I looked back at the list and I was like, wow, didn't expect that to happen that way, you know? But yeah, there's huge power in doing it. That's so cool, but uh, a while ago, like almost, I think the start of COVID, you and I uh, did some coaching together. And one of the things that that you did with me was actually uh, writing down a list of fifty things. I can't remember exactly what it was, you know. But I was, I was when I was doing the research for for this podcast, I was looking at those notes and stuff that we that we took. And one of the ones on there was like, I want to see more sunrises. So this was me writing it right this year, but I think I've seen. 98% of sunrises like I was like wow that's so weird like I'm doing that like I didn't even think but it's probably stored somewhere there in the subconscious you know what I mean yeah and, and that's the gift of, of the beauty of manifestation isn't it it's like this energetic form of thought you you know you receive this thought or you create or generate this this energetic thought form then you put it down into writing which takes it another another form of energy further and then you know, subconsciously, your brain is so clever, it starts to go and look for ways for to make those things happen. Even if, you know, you write it down two years ago, two years later, suddenly it shows up in your world. It's amazing what, what seeds you can plant to then, you know, create your reality down the line. Absolutely, but I've always, I've always admired like you and your mind and the way that you do things. And you just said just now that you actually, you know, you got one of your notebooks and, um, you've always like carried around a notebook, like to write down certain things. Um, like how did that come about? That, that, that's such a great habit. Yeah. Interesting. I, I think just, you know, as we start to listen to, to people that teach these things, um, I've always been very tactile. So I love, I love, I've always loved books. So to write, to have the feeling of touch and then to have something to actually open up and, and read, I guess, uh, probably stem from a love of reading early on and then, you know, translated into taking some of these thoughts and actually jotting them down and writing them. Um, and then I think just habits of study as well, you know, throughout school and university, it was always about 
you know, read and absorb and then jot down in, in word form. So yeah, it's great. And then you end up with multiple books with different subjects, right? You've got like, oh, you got your book for, I don't know, personal development stuff that you're taking on and then other podcasts that you're listening to. You're like, oh, that's interesting. I must remember that. And then, yeah, and then you've got resource to draw on later. And it's amazing how much stuff you can open up you know, even a year later and go, oh my God, wow, this is like powerful stuff. And it comes back at the right times when you need it, it almost feels like. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, you know, I, I actually kind of picked that habit up from you and I've got, I've got all these kind of little mole skins lying around the house, like <laughs> some of them half full, some of them like completely full. And it's amazing going back, reading some of those things. Like you said, you, you like, wow, this is quite profound, actually, you know, like, I mean, wow, I was actually quite smart back then. <laughs> Surprise yourself. <laughs> Why don't I use this more often? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where's that old Gareth? You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, classic. But so, like I mentioned, when um, almost in the start of COVID, uh, you and I did some coaching together, which was like really amazing. I think you had almost just kind of finished your your coaching certification with uh, John Maxwell. And um we went through, I think we got through about like eight weeks in the end with each other, which was really, really awesome. Uh, one of the things that like stood out for me was the the DISC assessment that we did. And it, for me, it was like so incredible how this assessment picked out my personality type, which is apparently an assessor, to the T. And I was like, you know, just rereading the stuff uh, yesterday. And I was like, wow, how did it, how does it know me like that well from, from answering some questions? It's such a great tool, isn't it? So powerful, powerful. So DISC, for those of you that don't know, is like a, it's a communication style assessment tool and everybody sort of has communication styles and also ways of expressing themselves and also picking up information. And generally we fall majorly into one of four categories, right? So you have, you know, you pick up information fast, you're good at making decisions and you're sort of an action taker. And then you've got people that are a little bit slower to absorb energy or, or information, but once they get it, it like it sits with them and they can be super consistent with that information and they're very reliable and trustworthy and they like to be part of a group. And then you've got the, the assessor, right? A little bit more cautious, wants to know the details, ask the why questions, you know, go into more study. It's like, prove that to me or how do you know that that's you know that what you're saying is actually true and then you want to go and marinate on it before you actually make a decision um so yeah it's super interesting tool and there's obviously there, there's a few different tools like that out there um but what's what is unbelievable and what is what is trippy is just how accurate it can be when you actually read it back to yourself and you're like yeah this is me <laughs> it's crazy it's crazy but and you know what's also crazy is like i mean how humans are complex right and and we we so different but then at the same time we like we're so similar because if you think of like say this you know the disc assessment it kind of like you you one of a few categories you know and uh, most people will fall into one of those so it's just kind of it's quite amazing how like humans are so different but so similar yeah and it's a it's a wee game you know, and the more and more we go down this road, I don't know if you're feeling the same as you're getting older, but it's just like this whole separation thing and that everybody is doing their own thing and that everybody is so smart and that everybody is their own like kingdom. And then I was like, dude, whatever's happening for you is happening to me. And whatever I'm experiencing, I know you've gone through the same shit because we are consciousness, the wave of consciousness all, you know, weave from the same tapestry. And on the outside, while we just look slightly different, we are literally parts of the same quilt and um and so it's beautiful that we're able to assess ourselves and then teach ourselves we're like this one big organism of artificial intelligence or biological intelligence that's just we keep learning about ourselves as we go yeah yeah but the the one thing about the this like the the disc assessment like i think you know it, it tells you like how to communicate say to this sort of type of person um, and I think, you know, like if you did this as a couple or if you did this in, say, the corporate world as a as a manager with your employees, honestly, I reckon you could avoid like 90 percent of sort of um, arguments or disagreements or whatever, because 
you know, you're actually told, okay, cool. This is what this person is like. This is almost how you should communicate with them. Um, and it would be so beneficial if kind of, you know, those sort of people did it with each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's about awareness, right? It's awareness on how other people receive information and understanding how you also project your information and then becoming a chameleon in essence, right? Like if you really want to connect with somebody, not just communicate to them, you need to understand how they receive the information. And then if you have the awareness of how they receive it, you can deliver it in a way that really sits with them. And that's what it's about. And I think, you know, Maxwell says the best, he always goes, you know, it's not about, it's not about how much you know, it's about what your audience comes to know. And that's the master of good communication, right? Is the ability to relay information so that it, the other person gets it and can use it. And then that clears up misunderstandings or assumptions or you know hurt feelings because you deliver the message in a direct way and i'm you know and and i found that rude because i'm an s-type personality and it's like well i'm just telling you to do your job and you're like yeah but you didn't tell me thank you afterwards so <laughs> yeah you're right normal relationships work relationships it's all about the fundamentals of communication Absolutely. But I mean, yes, yeah, communication, I think if we could get that right, we could just sort out so many of the issues uh, in the world um, on a grand scale and um, also just like ourselves in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, one other thing that um, I'd just like to touch on quickly, which was really interesting in what we did was, and this I think was part of the, that assessment was um, that people have like a public, a private and an under pressure type of personality. And we we behave differently even though we're the same person in all those scenarios, which is also like really interesting. Yeah, that is, that is, you know, we do, we all have the persona that we sort of exhibit when we buy ourselves in our most natural, comfortable state. That's like our true self. Um, and then we sort of enter the public arena and we start to put these masks on. So like, okay, how do people expect me to behave in this situation? Or if I'm given a title, you know, like, oh, now suddenly I've been made a, a VP or a CEO and, you know, CEOs need to be, you know, confident and direct and, you know, people must respect me kind of thing. And so we start to change how we behave, how we communicate. And, and then, of course, stress and pressure is a big one. And that normally also brings you back to your root, your actual deep programming because that's when you're in your flight and fight and flight response and then you go back and and start to act and behave in your in your real deep true essence it's so interesting uh some of the stuff that i um do in my coaching is around like emotional triggers and so a lot of emotional triggers like in especially like in you know uh heavy heated sort of uh discussions um or uh, situations um you can tie those back to events that happened like kind of when you were a youngster you know and that also sort of ties into there's there's some work called inner child um work which which all of us actually have to do um and we do have this kind of like little wounded inner child within us that we kind of need to speak to and yeah it's 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 such an amazing thing i don't know if you've done much kind of inner child work yourself Mm, shifts yeah it's, again that's like work that is ongoing because there's so many layers to it right but <clears throat> we are energetic beings right so really the essence of what we are when we look at each other through a microscope we start to see that we're just so vibrating right? and everything is at a frequency and we're emotional 90 percent emotional creatures right that's what we are and emotion being energy that's in motion all of our stimulus and all of our experiences carry with it energetic charge and so as we're growing from ages you know from the time that we're born through to what is it seven eight nine even up to 12 we're very impressionable right so we're being impregnated with with information from our caregivers and from elders and from our peers and we're starting to shape our values and our beliefs but a lot of what shapes our values and beliefs is also heightened emotional experiences so it could be a traumatic experience you know it could be you know maybe your your parent was short-tempered one night and you said something or you were making a noise and they decided to give you a you know a little pucks line <laughs> and and as a kid that's like 
traumatic, right? Like, holy shit, like, how did this happen to me? And it created this huge wave of energy in your biological system. And then instead of being able to cry, your parent was like, don't cry, you know, like, I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> My grandfather used to do to me, right? Like, if I was crying, like, do you want me to give you something to cry about? And there I was like, <laughs> shoving this energy down instead of being able to express it. And so that energy gets trapped inside of the body and it creates what we call a pain body. And so your mind is designed to protect you in the future. And it's looking and scanning for any stimulus that looks even remotely similar to that experience that was so traumatic. So you can either avoid it or you can confront it and attack it. Or sometimes maybe just get paralyzed in the situation, right? And so later on as an adult, if you haven't actually gone down and, and relived and, and expressed some of this energy, then you end up in a situation that's very similar to when your grandfather gave you a, a backhand and suddenly you're triggered and you feel either rage or you feel sadness or you, you know you get triggered and it's just that energy that hasn't run through the body and that's in your pain body and that's from being a, a little child that had a, a traumatic experience yeah exactly but ha have you have you identified any sort of things within yourself that uh, you know cause you to be triggered in in your life in any way mm. It's interesting we're busy doing some work now with with our friend gareth pickering on on relationships and, and learning about yourself and we're talking a lot about our archetypes and our wounded inner child and we have the lost boy and we have you know the prince or the princess and and all these different parts of you that were looking for love or didn't receive love or if you received love you received it because it was a transaction and so there, I mean, there've been a lot, a lot of discovering about myself. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share an experience with you. Okay, so this is what happened. I have had a pattern in relationships where I would find a connection or attract a connection, spark, relationship starts, everything goes great. Now there's a rising in feeling and I'm starting to fall in love with this other person. And then suddenly a story starts about, mm, hang on a second, this person somewhere in the background is uh, cheating on me. They have someone on the side, they're talking to someone, they're connecting with somebody, what's going on? And then this deep sort of rage and jealous little monster would come out in the relationship. And often I would prove it to be true. It's almost like I was manifesting this experience to happen. And it happened again and again and again. And eventually I was like, there's something here. There's something that's misaligned. There's a programming deep down inside because this is a pattern. And so after we had, and it was actually in those years, Gareth, when we were doing our coaching together, that really helped me to unlock a lot of the understanding of what was going on in the subconscious mind and how to go and, and work with this stuff. So anyway, in this particular instance, I recognized, I identified this pattern. There must be a story there, but I don't know where the story comes from. Why would I be so jealous? Why would I keep attracting these women that are doing this? And so I sit with my friend, Alex, and I say, Alex, listen, I have this issue. I know it's an energetic thing. Can you help me find it? And he's very good at dropping into very deep down uh, scanning meditations. And he's like, okay, if this is an energetic thing, let's scan your body and let's start to go and see if we can find where this energy is trapped. And I was like, I know it's coming from my solar plexus because this is where I feel my rage. This is where I start to feel the, the, the tightness and the blockage. And so we do this meditation and we're scanning, we're scanning, we're scanning. And then I start to feel it. I start to feel this little like, you know, it's like a combination of like sadness, but it's also rage. And I'm like, oh, I can feel it. And so I start touching it in this meditation. And then suddenly, boom, I have the whole memory back. Like I relived an experience when I was 17, falling in love for the first time, thinking that, you know, this is the girl for me. And next minute I find out that she's, you know, seeing some older guy from another school and I'm absolutely heartbroken. Brother. And I remember the conversation about hearing about it, how I felt in the moment. And it was just a 17 year old boy, absolutely destroyed, right? Anger, frustration, sadness, not feeling good enough, why doesn't she love me? And then going home, 
phoning her and saying, I know what you've been doing and I don't want to talk to you again, putting the phone down. And then instead of healthily expressing all this upsetness and allowing the energy to run, I just suppressed it. I'm like, I'm fine. Everything's going to be good. Move on with my life. And it was like putting all that energy into a little box somewhere down here, locking it up. But the problem is, every time I started feeling the same way about a girl, it opened that box. And so that same energy would start to run and I would start to express and relive the whole experience again. And so, yeah, there's, there's an identification. So anyway, the long and the short of it was there's exercises that you can do to actually release this energy. And guys, when I tell you that the energy was so powerful, I literally sat in the chair like, shaking vibrating like all of this stuff moving through me i suddenly burst into tears i wanted to scream and shout stomp my feet and the process lasted about 20 minutes it was huge amounts of energy stuck in there and i'm like a different person now though like i can tell you now categorically now when i walk into a relationship and i start to feel that like that whole story has now dissipated and is no longer part of my programming because that energy is now no longer stuck in my system. Wow. That's amazing. Like how that pattern repeated itself because of that kind of one instance, you know, and I'm sure that's like common for so many people and yeah, we don't even realize why we're acting out in certain ways. Um, but, but if we really, if we dig deep, like you did, it's sort of tied back to, to one kind of incident back in the day. Um, so it proves how important this work actually is, you know, and you probably feel a lot lighter and, um, you know, in your relationships and personally as well. Oh my God. Yeah. Hugely, hugely, you know, because everything again, like energy holds weight, right? So you have low vibration, which are heavy feelings and things like um, guilt, frustration, anger, jealousy, these are low vibrational forces, right? So when you've got these trapped in the body, like, yeah, it does make you feel heavy. And it, eventually it actually makes you sick. Talking about low vibrational energy, something I think a lot about is, is fear. And I think that sort of ties into low vibrational energy. And do you have any idea, like, why people are kind of, say, so fearful of maybe being themselves or going to do something for themselves in terms of like, you know, like say quitting your job and just going and doing, doing something you, you really, really want to do and you're passionate about. Um, what is it about fear that kind of holds people back and, and, and why are they like that? Do you have any sort of thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything that holds us back really comes stems from a seed of fear, right? If you look at the scale, it's like fear is on this side and love is on this side. And when you have love and light, you can't have fear. And when you have fear, it's very difficult to express or feel love. And fear often is a story. It's a pattern. Again, it could be from an experience that you had that didn't feel good in the moment that your brain is trying to protect you from. And so the story is, if you do this, it's going to make you feel like you did then and you don't want to do it so you shy away from having the courage to go and step through that fear and take the action to leave your job or to go and approach that good looking girl because you're scared that you're going to end up in a situation that made you feel like you did when that heightened emotional charge was set into your nervous system so yeah fear is a very interesting one because uh it's mostly illusory right they say that there's only two major fears that we're actually born with, right? And those are protective functions so that we can survive. And one is the fear of heights because we don't do well as humans falling off a, falling off a two-story rock, right? So if you're a caveman, you naturally have to have that built into you so that you didn't jump off a, a high thing and kill yourself. And the other one is loud noises, loud bangs, et cetera, because that often obviously indicates some kind of major danger that could, that could kill you physically. And then every other fear is, is learned. It's learned and experienced and it's patterns that we develop over our life. And sometimes we're given these fears from our caregivers and our parents because they had this programming and they literally imprinted it on you early on. Or you had a traumatic experience that has created a fear in you of doing something in the future. That's really interesting. I must say, I have this weird... Um... 
I don't know, like feeling when I, when I walk to say the edge of a, a cliff or something, I often feel like, like I just want to jump off it, you know, just, just to like experience it. You know what I mean? And I'm never going to do it, of course, but I'm always like, yes, yeah, I just want to jump off here, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's just a, a weird thing, but <laughs> um, so we're mostly here to talk about um, your kind of like new offering, um, Earth Medicine Miami. Um, but I would like to sort of uh, lead into that uh, with the, an experience that you and I had uh, when we went to Peru together. Uh, we we flew there uh, and we didn't really have any plans and we, we booked this uh, amazing like four day trip to Iquitos, uh, which is a place that you can only get in via boat or or plane. And we flew to Iquitos and then we got a like a I think it was like a two hour boat trip or even longer maybe uh, to where we were staying. So this was like deep Amazon, right? And uh, that night, um, our our guy, what was his name again? Edward, sorry? Edwin. Edwin. Um, yeah, he said to us, he's like, do you guys want to do like ayahuasca? And I was like, well, you know, you, I think straight away you went, yeah, I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so the next night we actually did it. Um, and it was, it was you, me, and then one of the other girls that was kind of staying there. And uh, wow, it was such a crazy experience, wasn't it? You know, we had this like proper shaman that um who knows where this guy came from in, in the deep dark amazon but uh but uh yeah we we had this uh i would say rather amazing experience um where by i mean i saw things that i i've never ever seen again in my life that's for sure like uh these crazy almost like monsters coming out of the roof um i had i had recall of memories of people that i've that I like have never thought of for like, you know, 20, 30 years sort of thing. And, you know, and then like you end up sort of purging a hell of a lot. And, um, but it was such a cool experience as well, kind of just doing it together, like in the deep dark Amazon. I don't know what's your memories like of that, that's, uh, that, that time that we had together. Well, you know, that's one of the greatest, the greatest experiences I think we've ever had. Certainly in my books, right? Because number one, it was so unexpected. Two, you and I were so unprepared and we had no idea what ayahuasca was. I think you had heard of ayahuasca, but you didn't really know what it was. I'd never heard of ayahuasca, so I had no idea what it was. And you and I had made a pact that the, for that trip, we were going to say yes to everything. And so when Edwin said, hey, do you want to do ayahuasca? And I was like, what is it? And he's like, oh, you know, the, the tribes here, they use it in ceremony and they, you know, they connect with the, the spirits of the forest. And we were like, okay, yes, let's do it. And we are like, how much is it? And he's like, oh, it's $2. <laughs> so we're like, cool, we're in. And <clears throat> I still remember us sitting in that room. It was like, remember, it was that wooden deck with the mosquito netting out in the middle of the jungle with that American girl that was also in the camp, Edwin, who came and gave us buckets. And we were like, what do we need the buckets for? And he's like, oh, you're going to get sick. And I looked at you and I'm like, what are we signing up for here? And this guy, they call him curanderos, right? Which are like the South American medicine men. But I remember he rocked up in his own little long boat with a pair of like gray shorts on, no shirt, no shoes, and a Coke bottle with that purple liquid of ayahuasca. And then he came in and he had his tobacco pipe and that leaf shaker. And he came around and gave us each that shot. And I think you and I almost vomited just from the taste of it. It was so like hectic. And I remember sitting there and was super uncomfortable, right? Because all we had was the wooden floor. There were no yoga mats. There were no cushions. It was like the craziest like <laughs> setup ever. And I think after 30 minutes, I looked at you and I was like, Gareth, listen, like, do you feel anything? What are we supposed to be feeling? Because if this carries on in 10 minutes, I'm going to bed. I'm like, I'm uncomfortable. And you were like, yo, let's go to bed in 10 minutes if nothing happened. And literally, as we said that, but both you and me were just like, oh my god what is going on and i just remember just this vortex and the most insane and most incredible visuals that for when you see that dmt space for the first time is just so unbelievable and so deep and so ornate i mean like you can't describe the patterns and the shapes and the colors and how everything makes sense but you're lost in that space and yeah, that was one hell of a journey, but and 
just to quickly share with you, do you remember, do you remember the next day going out into the middle of the river and swimming with those pink dolphins? And then walking in the jungle, and I was like, Gareth, you won't believe this. But last night, ayahuasca told me it was going to fix my knee because I had a, I had knee pain, like, and we were worried. I was worried that we weren't going to be able to climb Machu Picchu because I had this knee pain, and uh, it cured my knee. Yes, I don't remember the knee. I remember you had like a, a, a sore knee. I don't, I don't remember it being that bad. But I was actually going to mention the pink dolphins. But I was like, because I woke up the next morning and I was kind of, I still felt a bit like of a blur. You know what I mean? And and then we went on this boat trip in the Amazon, like on the Amazon River, which is massive. Like, I mean, I still can't believe how big it was. And we were, weren't even on like a big part of it. You know, we were on this like little estuary part of it. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then I kind of almost had to like pinch myself when we dove in the water and there were these like massive pink dolphins there. And I was like, yes, he, am I like... Am I imagining this? You know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was pretty crazy. But like, I mean, incredible really, wasn't it? Yeah, no, that was that was such an incredible journey. I think I've told that story in detail maybe like 200 times. Like, incredible. One of my other favorite memories of that trip was when we went like away from the camp that we stayed at to that like way out other like only tree house sort of that only one person or two people can go to um we went there with edwin on like one of those little long boats uh, well I, I can't yeah i mean it was a long boat trip and a long walk and um then i think in like another long boat trip and uh yes i was like thinking where is this oak taking us you know what i mean like i mean you start worrying about things like crocodiles and and everything like that you know <laughs> you're just like so just jumping out of the tree yeah absolutely um and then we we went to this i mean i don't know how long it took but it felt like it took ages to get there also because it was so flipping hot like it was so hot and we were getting like attacked by mozzies <laughs> it was so crazy um massive ones and then we got to this tree house like kind of you know just at sort of dusk i would say and um yeah, we, we sat down there and like, we got all of our gear off and then we, and then we put this mozzie net over all of us. And, um, it was one of the most amazing, like almost sleeps I've ever had because, well, it was weird because you almost couldn't get to sleep because of all the animals making like, like, I mean, it was the loudest noises ever, you know, because all of them were making every single noise they possibly could. But then at the same time, it was like the most soothing thing ever. And you just like, you just drifted away eventually and then in the morning we woke up at this like you know massive like in the, looking overlooking this massive kind of like escarpment of the the amazon jungle and it was wow that was a cool cool night and experience hey yeah wow yeah once in a lifetime but incredible incredible and and it was so uncomfortable i just remember we didn't have a mattress we literally slept on a hard wooden floor with that little mosquito net and we were each on a separate floor right because they had only made little decks for one person to sleep on on each level. I, I was like, Gareth, I'm at the top, brother, because whatever animals are down here, they're going to snap you and Edwin first. Yeah. Oh, but, and, and, and you know what was so crazy? Because we had those, those mozzie nets. You could literally hear the mozzies trying to attack you all night. Like, that was one thing that I like. Mm -hmm. I actually think I woke up a few times because I was like, yes, these guys just want to eat me. No, brother, you know, that like that whole trip was incredible, except for the mosquitoes. Like those mosquitoes are next level. I remember we had rain jackets on and those things were coming in and they were stinging us literally through the rain jackets. There was not there was nothing you could wear to protect yourself. And I, for a week after that, we were both like <laughs> scratching ourselves. Yeah, but that was that was crazy, man. Was, but like you said, just uh once in a lifetime, so many great memories and uh yeah thanks for thanks for that experience but <laughs> so last time last time you were on the podcast uh one of the things that stood up out for me was um you had this like one line or few words where you went you know you, you know it's about hitting the reset button <laughs> um and you know for you yourself like it feels like you're kind of following your your own advice and uh you know one of the things that you uh, are offering now um, through your Earth Medicine uh, Miami 
is, um, you know, I guess helping people with, with certain troubles that they have um, through uh, different sort of uh, plant medicines. I was just wondering if maybe you could talk about like how that whole thing almost like came about for you, you know, like I know that you went out to Mexico a few times and stuff and, and you experienced this yourself. So maybe you can kind of start with, with that. Yeah. Interesting journey. You know, when I look back at it and I trace what's happened over the last five years, the greenie started in 2019 and I really feel like what's happened is there's this huge shift of change happening for all of us. And I think it started that year before COVID, right? <clears throat> and I received the download to be like, Ryan, listen, you need to go and start microdosing and learning about psilocybin, like magic mushrooms. I mean, I really hadn't had didn't have any experience with it before, but I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, I don't know why I'm receiving this message. And I went and I found a friend and he had, and then I started like learning meditation. And a book that came into my world at that stage was Becoming Supernatural. So Joe Dispenza's book, read the book, started practicing his meditations, and then starting to experiment with some microdosing to drop into these really beautiful deep states of, of um, you know, those states of freedom that you feel when, you, when you're in, in proper meditation state. And so that journey for like six months before, it almost primed me for the experience I was about to have. And so in December, I'm, this is December 2019 now, I'm sitting in a coffee shop and a friend of mine comes in and we strike up conversation and she now is vibing. She's looking radiant. She's super like, you know, in a good state. I'm like, wow, you know, Erica, what's going on with you? And she goes, well, I've just come back from New York. There's a, uh, there's a, a medicine man from, from Mexico that was up there and we sat in the ceremony and she like shows me these, these marks on her leg. And she goes, this is Cambo. And, you know, they burn this in your skin. And I'm like, what? And then she's like, yeah, and then we did Bufo. And I'm like, what is Bufo? And she like tried to explain it to me, but didn't do a very good job. But something in me was like super interested. And then she goes, yeah. And in January, this guy's going to be in Mexico and he's doing a ceremony on the 11th of January at 11, 11 in the morning. And that's all she had to say. I was like, oh, cool. So what date and how do we get there? So I literally booked my ticket to Mexico right there and then for the weekend that she was talking about and uh and i committed i was like cool i'm gonna go do this thing but much like an ayahuasca trip i didn't do much research on it. in fact i did no research on it i just sort of you know trusted the process i'm feeling a calling i'm gonna go and experience this thing and so i go back to south africa um and that second week of january we're now back in miami i fly down to mexico and we arrived there on a Friday. The ceremony is happening on a Saturday. It's a full moon. And um, I arrive on this beach with this guy that's dressed in white with a red bandana on and uh, eight other people. And nobody speaks bloody English. Bro. So <laughs> like from Brazil, from Spain, from South America. And I'm trying to catch on now what's going on and what we're supposed to expect. All we've been told is bring five liters of water. So there you rock up. We walk down the beach and we end up under these beautiful palm trees and he sets up with all these mats. And we sit down and he doesn't speak English. Bro. So he's like, come and see that, take off. I'm like, oh, okay. So I take my shirt off and I see the other guys take their shirt off. And he's saying, bebe, bebe, you must drink, you must drink water. So I'm like, okay, cool. So now we're chugging this water. And uh, the next minute uh, he comes along and he starts burning these like marks into my arm here. And I'm like, okay, everyone else is doing it. I think I'm okay. And then he comes along and he starts to apply this gel. And he's already applied this medicine. It's called Cambo to the three people next to me. And I comes to me. And by the time he's getting to me, these guys are already purging. They've already turned green. One of the guys is looking like a frog and he's purging. And I'm like, oh God, like one of these moments, what have I signed up for here? So what this is, and this is one of the medicines that we work with, it's a very powerful concoction, cocktail of neuropeptides and purgatives that help to detoxify and cleanse the body. And it's applied through the skin 
It comes from the skin of a giant monkey tree frog. It's about this big, luminescent green, beautiful red eyes, lives in the Amazon. And the story goes that how they found out about this was that back in the day, however many years ago, was a guy, in one of the tribes, his wife was very sick and she was about to die and he's praying now, he's praying, he's like, I need help, you know, how can I heal my wife? And he receives a message from the plants to say, go find this frog, use the secretion from the skin and apply it to your wife. And he healed her. So they've been using it in these tribes in the Amazon <clears throat> for a very long time. So this is now what he's applied to us. So now suddenly I'm like feeling nauseous and everybody around me is like, you know, making these weird sounds. And I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is horrific. And the next minute I just start purging and purging, but like a deep purge. And there's luminescent greens and there's luminescent oranges coming out. And then I'm like starting to have all these little like memories of like stuff that's coming out. So it's not only a physical cleansing, but it's also an emotional cleansing and you're moving energy out of your body. And the way he described it afterwards to us was your body is a temple and the way in is the gateway to reach divine consciousness, right? So you need to prepare your body, cleanse your body so that when you go into an elevated state, you really have an easier way <clears throat> to connect with source. So we go through this process and now I'm starting to feel better. It's quick. It's only about 10 or 15 minutes, the whole thing. And in the meantime, he's come along and he served us what's called changa. It's the bark of a tree in Mexico that contains DMT. But it's a very quick acting DMT that takes you into that space. It's almost like it blasts you whoop, into that energetic space. It's very visual. But when you are experiencing already these waves of nausea, it just it triggers another deep purge. And so... <laughs> We have this whole experience. I'm laying on the beach there. I'm recovering. Oh, thank God, this is all over. Okay, that wasn't so bad, but you know, it was pretty good. And wow, I'm glad I did it. And then he looks at me and he goes, you ready? I'm like, what do you mean am I ready? Like, aren't we done? And he's like, no, 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 now, go for it. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my gosh, what are we in for here, yeah, bro? So I go and I sit down with him. And the way this whole thing is laid out is very, it's beautiful. It's very ceremonial. There's a beautiful prayer that you read beforehand. And as I'm reading this prayer, I'm suddenly starting to realize like, oh my God, this is like, this is a real serious moment in my life. Like I can feel the energy and the transmission of these words. I don't know what I'm about to experience, but it's, it's, it's pretty important. And I finish reading the prayer coaches me through some breathing and then he brings his pipe and he starts lighting this and he's like <laughs> so i start breathing in gareth and when i'm looking at his eyes i start to hear it sounded like a tractor on both sides of the other side of the world starting to like in the distance come closer and closer and it's like a and it's the frequency starting to rise and then as it starts to feel like it's getting closer, my eyes start to flicker and everything starts to shift in my reality. And before I know it, like what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling is all merged into one big cocktail of energy. And there's a moment as I feel my energy rising from like literally the deep seat of my, my inner being here, it starts to rise. And I hit a flat pan. Yeah. My mind switches on and goes, Ryan, what are you doing? <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. And I'm trying to hold on. And I'm already like basically melted. And I suddenly hear this beautiful voice next to me. And I swear, like when I say it was my angel, it was an angel. This voice, I just heard it say surrender. And as I heard that voice, I just relaxed and let go of everything. But I dropped a thousand feet. So you talk about standing on the edge and wanting to know what it feels like to jump off a building. You jump off a building. And I jump and I feel my stomach turning. Suddenly I'm suspended, bro, in a perfect bubble of white light. 
you can't see the, the ends of this rim or whatever this expansiveness is. And I feel that. Samadhi. Pure bliss. It is the most perfect moment that it, it's it's indescribable, but it's like a moment of knowing. And I just remember my mind for one second going, oh my God, this is God. And as I'm like realizing what I'm experiencing, it's so overwhelming that I just literally burst into a million pieces. And in the bursting, I feel this roar, like this primordial like roar kind of, I was like, ah! <laughs> and I don't know what came out of me, but I disappeared from consciousness. Gone. Gone, gone, gone. That's all I remember. The next minute, I hear a voice. Ryan, Ryan. And I'm like, is that me? I'm like, yeah, that's me. But that, that's me hearing me from a distance. What's going on here? And then I start to recognize that I'm breathing. And I'm like, Okay, I'm not in the body, but I can hear someone breathing. And then suddenly my senses of, of feeling switch back on and I feel the sand underneath me. And I'm like, oh, that's right, I'm on a beach. And then I start to hear birds. And then I realize that I'm on this like beach of Elysium, just this beautiful sort of undulating wave of energy, pure bliss. And then my mind goes, hey, this is pretty amazing, but you may want to check that you're actually still alive. <laughs> so I'm laying there, I'm like, okay, let me just open my eye, open it, but, and above me, the palm tree, Gareth, and I tell you that you see the matrix. I saw every little crystalline structure of the matrix that makes up everything. And then suddenly it all came back into full normal view. <laughs> and I was back in my normal reality. And I looked over. And the medicine man, the dude, is sitting on that side about to serve somebody else. And he looks over at me with this like cheeky little grin. And he winks. And we had this moment. And the, the conversation was, now you get it. But I got up. I went and I dived into the ocean. And I burst into tears. Because for the first time in my life, I actually felt alive. Like I realized... 39 years of my life, but I've been fast asleep, just been running on automatic, bro. not really feeling, not really sensing, not really taking time to appreciate. And for the first time, I felt like I understood what the sun on my skin was doing. I could smell the salt in the water. I was like literally reborn. And that was the beginning of, of my journey for the last few years. You have amazing storytelling skills. Um, that was really good, but uh, yes, man. Thanks for thanks for sharing that experience. And yeah, I felt like I was kind of like I actually I'm like sitting on the end of, end of my seat now. I was like kind of living that experience with you. It sounds extremely profound, man. So when you said like you you felt like you truly living, you know, that was the first time. Like, have you felt? like that's like you live more now like in a in a better way as a result of that experience yeah yeah for sure there's you know i think our programming runs so deep Gareth, and then we are you know fundamentally in this 3d composite of duality and separation that it's very easy for us to slip back into the mechanism of almost living like a zombie life but more and more and more and the more you practice and the more you get into your meditation and the more you just get into your breathing and actually realize that, oh, I'm being distracted right now versus let me bring myself to center. Yes, to answer your question for sure. Way, way more than, than previously. Yeah. That's awesome. I almost get kind of sad how almost, you know, probably 99% of us are, like you said, going around in zombie mode. And we don't even realize it, you know, we're missing out on so many like, great experiences and interactions and little moments uh, because we, I don't know, we're so distracted from reality, I feel. And I almost like think that 
people are going to, you know, be on their deathbed and, and like just regret so much because of how we've lived life, especially in this modern age. You know, I think a lot of it boils down to certainly my, my, my personal sort of downloads and way of looking at it is it's almost like we have an expectation that everything has to be good and that if we're experiencing some kind of pain or things that we need to look at to experience all of the emotions, we've like almost made a decision. We only want to experience the good emotions. And so we do everything in our power to avoid anything that makes us feel sad or grieve or upsetness or rage. And so we live in this weird space of not really doing the things that could cause those. And so we only live a quarter of our life. And so the lesson I always try and explain to people is like, these kind of experiences teach you that when you come back into your real world, to remember that you're not trying to escape this experience. You're not trying to escape this life. You're not trying to escape the fact that everything is temporary in this world, right? Things are going to break. Things are going to get stolen. Things are going to get burned down. People are going to die. You're going to die. And so when you can accept all of that, the, the impermanence of everything in your life, you can start to enjoy them while you have them. And it's about remembering that we signed up to come and have this human experience. So how do we do it better? How do we do it more fully? How do we learn to get in touch with all of these feelings so that when we're upset, we can express it safely or, you know, when, when a loved one dies, to be there with them, to feel what that feels like when they transition and process your grief. Because when we leave this body, we don't get to experience that again. It's all undulating energy after that. And so we've got to come into these human bodies to actually experience. And so the call is, hey, we're here. Let's wake up. Let's feel it. Let's, let's do this thing. Let's feel the rawness, the rawness of what life is. I read this really amazing thing. I think it was this week. Uh, well, first of all, just sort of you know, maybe backtracking a little bit. You know how we kind of like almost told, you know, when, when, when you know, say during, um, uh, you know, when you conceived effectively, you know, as, as a little kind of um, baby um, that, you know, you this, you have like a one in four trillion chance of being, you know, that you that sperm that kind of like, makes its way to the kind of egg, right? I, I read something even more amazing this week that this guy, I know he's like, yeah, science proves this. I'm like, okay, cool. I don't know. I don't know if we really do know, but um, he goes, he said that the egg chooses the sperm. And I was like, wow. So he's like, your life is even more amazing than you can even begin to imagine because you are chosen he's like it's almost like there's these you know obviously little sperms that are like you know all just swimming as fast as they can to the uh to the egg uh to impregnate it and you know you you could be the guy right at the back you know and and th there's this like force field and there goes no no all you all you little guys and girls, you're just going to have, you're just going to, I'm just going to like not allow you in. And then when you come there, like swimming right from the back, like it opens up for you and you're like, okay, you're the chosen one. And I was like, wow, that's something I can really believe in, you know? And that for me made like, I was like, geez, imagine if we can believe in ourselves that much that we were really chosen and, and we're, we're really here for a reason. And even better, we're all here together for some greater reason than we could even begin to possibly imagine. How does that feel? Yeah, exactly. You know, like these are great things to ponder. And, you know, if we can think like that, you know, then you'll be like, ah, you know what? Maybe I should do that thing I've been saying I should do, you know, because I've been chosen to be here. So for me, I was like, wow, this is just an amazing way to look at things. <laughs> I want to believe it's true, but. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, the, great, the, great, like the great mystery of life, isn't it? It's like it just boils down to it's all a great mystery. And we're getting to live it in real time. And we're the first right now having this experience because it hasn't happened yet. We are literally riding the wave of consciousness. 
And what a gift. What a gift to be aware of that, guys. But it's like we're so worried about some kind of calamity happening in our life and somehow suffering <clears throat> that it stops us from really living. And so when Terence McKenna says the best, he's like, you know, your greatest, your greatest freedom happens when you stand on the edge, the edge of the abyss and you jump off the edge and you land on the feather bed. It's like, you know, the universe has you, like God has you, like look at your life. It's always, it's always worked out in some way, shape or form. One of the guys that I love listening to speak, his name is Zach Bush. I'm sure you, you familiar with him. I was listening to him recently on, on Rich Roll. And uh, this guy, I mean, he must be one of the smartest guys out there. Um, just, I guess, when it comes to human nature and humans and the body and stuff. And, and he's dedicated the last 12 years of his life to literally studying a single cell, right? And in this podcast, he's like, he's like, Rich, after 12 years of dedicating my life to studying a single cell, I now realize that we know almost nothing about humans, the body, human nature, consciousness, like nothing. And he's like, and I've studied this more than anybody in the entire world. He's like, because I can't tell you everything about a single cell. He's like, never mind how the trillions or however many cells you have in your body, how they interact with each other. Never mind about the billions of mitochondria you have. Never mind about everything else, um, your environment. He's like, it is impossible for us to even begin to think that we know almost anything about what it means to be human. And uh, I, like just listening to this, I was like, wow, that was just another like amazing thing to, to realize, you know, that it's almost like magic uh, that we hear and that we exist. And, and for that reason, you know, again, like flip, just live 100%, you know, to your, I don't know, beliefs, truth, uh, enjoyments, fun, like, you know what I mean? Like, just do it because, yeah, see, we don't even know anything, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> just about ourselves, never mind about our ecosystem and everything involved. And it's just like, I was like, wow, it was quite a, an amazing thing to listen to incredible i live in an infinite universe with infinite possibilities and so you know just i think the biggest lesson is just keep your mind open because we don't know so just open your mind to it all what's possible everything what else is out there who knows i mean it'll blow our mind if we had to really like start to see what's out there i believe like make avatar look like you know a normal thing <laughs> Exactly, not a, like a, this amazing sci-fi movie, but uh, yeah. But I'm really like proud of you as as a friend and uh, like what you're doing at the moment. And I think like the the world needs like more people like like you. Um, you know, in terms of just like what you offer and how you offer it, in terms of uh, the sort of love, uh, high frequency vibes. Um, and knowledge that you kind of like bring. Um, I was wondering maybe like if you can just sort of spend like a few minutes telling us a little bit about like Earth Medicine Miami, like what is it? And, um, you know, like what are you trying to achieve with it as well? Yeah, thank you, Joe. So the, the, the tagline for what, what is sort of created here in Miami is uh, feel better, live better, right? Because what I'm noticing more and more is that so many people are struggling. They're struggling with their mental health. They're struggling with their physical health. They don't feel good. They feel lost. Depression, anxiety, addictive patterns, and basically discontentment. No matter how much money you have or how much that you think you've created, I've seen people that have on the surface what looks like everything and yet are deeply, deeply depressed and feeling disconnected from themselves and unable to be in a healthy relationship. So anyway, the, 
the premise of what we're doing is, I believe, is a global, it's a global uprising right now. We're, we're riding the sort of third wave of the, the psychedelic renaissance right now, which is the plant world and these medicines from the earth coming back into our experience to help us rebalance, tap into our true gifts, reactivate DNA that has been dormant for ages so that we can discover new gifts and way of actually being and connecting with each other. And so Earth Medicines Miami aims to, number one, like be a source of education for people so people can start to look for alternative ways to deal and process with everything from emotional trauma to maybe trying to break addictions. <clears throat> I work a lot with people that are addicted to things like Adderall, Xanax because they're anxiety, um, alcohol, um, bad behaviors, maybe they're addicted to pornography or sex or, you know, all of these things that basically stem from some kind of deep energetic imbalance. And so we want to make it available so people can educate themselves and learn more about what is available and how these things are worked with and then make it available to them so that if they choose to step into this world and do the deep work and use these medicines to help them, that it's then available for them. And then the biggest part, and this is what we say, like we call them medicines, right? Because medicines are supposed to make you feel better, pharmaceuticals, I believe, are drugs, <laughs> not the other way around. But um, <clears throat> there's no silver magic pill, right? Like you don't want people to come to this and go, oh, I'm just looking for this thing to fix me. It's like, this will help lift and shift a lot of what you won't be able to do talking about it, right? Like you can in 10 minutes on Bufo have the equivalent of 20 years of psychotherapy. Like it's going to be that. It's going to shift you that radically. But then you still need to come back into your life and integrate and figure out where you still need to put your focus and your attention in your life to clean up your mind, to clean up your life, to install positive habits physically, mentally, spiritually, so that you start to feel better and act better in the world. And one of the big things that we're creating right now is community, right? So we have a second part of our circle, which is the circle of fire. And this is a community that we're starting to build. So everybody who comes to the medicine comes to the community afterwards. And every Wednesday we sit on the beach and we have a little fire and it's a moment to connect with each other on a personal level. We get to talk about what's happening in our week. We get to listen to each other. And then we allow the element of the flame to transmute right to make new so anything that you let letting go of that you need to express or just be supported on you get them to leave feeling lighter feeling heard feeling connected because for how long gareth did we as humans live in tribes so we always had our family around us and we had the extended family around us so as a young kid you'd have the aunties and the uncles and the you know other people's brothers and the cousins everyone was living together and then you would sit around the fire and you would learn from each other so as a young kid you had your parents talking about their experience working and hunting and gathering and then you had the grandparents who've done all of that and now teaching you the deeper wisdom of having lived longer but now we sit in cities bro like miami is full of people and yet everybody lives in a little pigeonhole in an apartment and we go to work and we come back and we're not connected with with the community so people are working and we're productive and we're doing and we're moving and we don't know why we're doing these things and we're trying to fill our life with fancy cars and smart apartments and all this extra stuff and then we lay in bed at night and we feel lonely and so two parts to this whole thing help you with the medicine help really like do deep energetic physical movement and flushing out to then unpack your backpack with all the stuff that you're carrying that's making you sick and then come and be part of a community where you feel connection again and you start to learn about each other's gifts and you start to do things together again and create the family structure again and everybody holds an archetype so no matter what age you are no matter whether you're male or female you hold the archetype younger brother sister mother auntie grandparent and we get to sit around again and share each other's gifts with each other. So that's really that's really the deep work that we're trying to do right now is to lift and shift and then bring people to community. The second part is so important because I feel like people go to these experiences and you have this like 
amazing time and um, you find out whatever it is about yourself and and you're like, wow, you know, and then the next day you're like still kind of like, wow, but not as wow, you know, <clears throat> and then you go away, like I said, and you go into your day-to-day -day life and you almost forget about what it is that you experience and you don't have anything to implement and so many people lose out uh, on on that opportunity, you know, and sort of capitalize on what they actually experience. So that, that second part is amazing. And I think it's, um, that's what's going to kind of like separate uh, you guys from anybody else that that's offering it. I was wondering, Ryan, like lots of people say that you should only go to sort of, you know, do say plant medicines and, and, and those sort of things. Once you've actually, you know, done a bit of other work beforehand, you know, is this something you advise people to do as well? Yeah, interesting. I think I think there's no real playbook, to be honest, right? I always tell people, look, there is a spirit moving in the world. There's the spirit of Cambo, there's the spirit of Bufo, there's the spirit of ayahuasca, there's the spirit of peyote, right? These are real energetic spirits and entities that are living in this world and they are in tune with us. And what they're doing is they're starting to call us to give us what we need. And so every journey, every person has got a different journey and routes to sitting with whatever medicine that they end up sitting with. And I always tell people that if you're sitting with us right now, you're supposed to be here. Because on some level, if you're not supposed to, something would have come up or something would have stopped you from even arriving here. But once you arrive, it doesn't matter what your preparation was, whether you know nothing about it, whether you've done deep Vipassana meditation and dark rooms and you've been studying these things for the last year, Yes, there's that also, but you need it when you need it. And the spirit is so intelligent that it's going to call you when, when you're ready. And so, yes, while it probably is in preparation, a good idea that if you hear about it, to so start to do the inner work, start to drop into some meditation exercises. But again, there could be energies that are stopping you from actually being able to do that. And sometimes you just need something stronger to come and basically unblock you so that you can then start to drop into those practices. So I guess to answer your question, just like life, there's no real, there's no real, it has to be this way. And sometimes I think people get confused, right? And I don't know if that's just a bit of ego, people trying to take control of something that they're not in control of to say, no, 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 you have to do this before that. Or no, no, this medicine is better than that medicine. It's like, we don't know, right? This is bigger than us. And so we're just guides and we're just channels for this thing to be made available to people. Tell me more about these spirits. Are there like negative or evil spirits as well that are trying to sort of, I guess, sort of combat or, or fight these good spirits that exist? Mm, yeah, very good question. Yes, is the short answer. And the more we dance in this world and the more we sort of see and experience other people's processes and the more we sort of guided in the space, the more you start to realize that, yes, energy is all encompassing, right? So we have a spectrum from dark and heavy to light and everything in between. And these entities or spirits that we talk about are energetic forms that have an intelligence that move in the spaces between and in the spaces that we don't see normally when we're in this vibration. So our senses are dialed into a very specific vibration that allows us to see the physical computer or touch the physical body or sense and hear what we can hear on those frequencies. But then when you start to dial into let's say an energetic frequency of psilocybin, you start to open the aperture of the eyes and you can start to see the energetic fields of things or you can start to see the deeper layers of composites of trees and plants and animals and even yourself if you look in the mirror. And then you go into the space that we went into with ayahuasca and now you start to dive and delve into an even deeper layer of energy and frequency and vibration where other spirits and entities are living. And every entity has its own way of being, right? So dark energies, entities, also feed. And it can happen that these entities enter our body and they start to feed on our psychic energy, on our physical energy. Depression, I believe, is an entity, right? 
I've seen it enough times now when people purge dark energy and it comes out as like black tar. And as they're purging, you can feel a wave, you can feel a shift of like heaviness move out of their body. And then they feel lighter and they're better. And it's almost like the depression has gone because you've moved this. And as weird as it, as it sounds to say this stuff, Garrett, like in my reality, it's becoming more and more and more true. It's like irrefutable that you see it. And people that experience it will tell you the same thing. It's like, it feels like something was in me that was basically draining me of my power that has now come out. Um, and again, so what we're trying to do is alchemize, right? What is alchemy? Alchemy is the, the transmutation of one form into another form. And so we're trying to basically transmute heaviness into light. And that's the lifting and the shifting that happens. So yeah, it's, it's all around us. And if you start to open your eyes and you start to really observe, you can see it in people. You can see it in people's eyes. You can see it in the way that they're behaving. You can you can start to tell. You can be like, this person, there's something else that's running the program there. There's something else that the biology is, you know, it's not, they're not themselves. I've seen people walk in, they look 55. They leave and they look 25. And suddenly there's a light in their eyes again. And you can see like the skin has become younger because the energy has changed. It's almost like a, you can make a horror movie out of this in many ways, hey, because you know these people have something inside of them which is effectively like sucking them of life and and energy, and you know through the process of of what you take them through, you allow them to get rid of that, and then they're like, "Whoa, jeepers," you know, and and that's that's pretty amazing. It's interesting what you said about the eyes as well. Andrew Huberman he says that the eyes are an extension of the brain. And you can effectively tell a lot about a person by just kind of looking at their eyes in terms of like their mindsets and that sort of stuff. And ever since he said that, I've become much more conscious of looking at people's eyes, you know, and you can kind of look at some people and you go, jeepers, there's just like a blank look in that person, you know, or like they just kind of, I don't know, they, they just like, they look like they, they lost or whatever it is. And, and so what you said is very, very true, but um the more you become conscious of these things, the more you sort of start noticing them. It's pretty crazy, eh? It is crazy. It is cra it's, It really is. And it's about conscious awareness. What are we trying to do right now? We're moving into a different part of, you know, the solar system itself is moving to a different part in the cosmos, right? The sun is now starting to release different types of radiation. And all this energy is starting to change the frequency of the earth. And we're an extension of the earth. So we're starting to change. That's why... Our consciousness is starting to change. That's why the way we deal with the planet, more people are saying, why are we chopping down all the rainforests? Why are we polluting our rivers like we have? It's like we've been asleep for the last hundred years, destroying our own home. <laughs> it's like you have to be asleep to be doing that. Right? How else do you explain it? That a person would walk onto a beautiful beach and leave, you know, plastic wrappers and a broken bottle on the beach. It's like, come on, no human being, when they are sane and when they're in a good state, would do that. So yeah. yeah, yeah, that sort of stuff blows my mind, bud. And um, definitely, something that irritates me is is those things, you know, like where people just don't give a shit about like our our environments by like you know throwing stuff on the floor and you know things that are so easy to kind of not do. Um, it's it's highly frustrating, you know. And obviously, it's like I mean, you you, you take everyone that does that, and it's just this, you know, got seven billion people in the world that are just sure slowly slowly um you know just making everything more polluted and that's one thing that that winds me up <laughs> massively <laughs> um so i was just wondering um do you, uh something that you speak about is love right uh love being the highest frequency can you just like touch on that a little bit and you know like what it what it kind of means mm. So again, going back to sort of the scale of energies, right? Low dark vibration. Let's call the bottom. The bottom of the bottom is fear, terror. It's all the things that we are scared of, the things that stop us from doing stuff. And then as you come up the scale, jealousy, anger, fear, doubt, or sorry, doubt. Um, then we start to move into the higher vibrations like uh, confidence, compassion, doing good, generosity, and then love 
And love, if you have to imagine, like let's say we were playing a guitar, it's like hitting that one note where you just lose yourself. You know, like when you listen to like a really well put together track and it's almost like it just hits this peak and you feel like you're flying, right? That is the love frequency. That is the ultimate light and true love, which is really our core essence, which is what we come from, is all dissolving. Like when there is that amount of high average by frequency and vibration, it overpowers everything below it. And there's obviously different levels of love. And we experience some of those different kinds of love in our human experience. But where we go back to and where we come from is the source consciousness love, which is that moment of pure bliss. And I believe that things like Bufo, specifically Bufo, take you to give you a little taste, a millisecond of a perfect moment where you feel what that bliss actually feels like. You know, you hear, you hear gurus talking about it, like drop into meditation and I reach samadhi. It's that transcendent feeling of pure love frequency vibration. And once you've had a taste of it, once you've like, oh my God, that's what it feels like. It's like it fills your cup. And then what you're trying to do in your normal life is how do I live? And how do I act in my life that is closely or more closely aligned to what love feels like? And where there's that high vibration of love, that's the real medicine. Because when you have pure love, you don't want to get angry at people. When you really love people and you see them acting funny and before it used to trigger you, now you can have compassion for them. Say, I know that you're only saying that to me because you're hurting inside. That's what love does. Love transmutes. Love changes how you look at the world. Love changes how you interact in the world to be better. Zach Bush again, he said something amazing. And I listened to this like years ago, right? He said he used to work on this ward uh, in one of the clinics that, uh, you know, where people were kind of like effectively dying and um, often they revive people. And when, after they revived them, they, he would, he would speak to them and like literally the, the same message that he got almost every time was like, why did you bring me back? I was I've never experienced what I experienced there. It was the most peaceful, blissful, amazing moment of my life. So this like transcendence and transition into whatever it is that happens when we die was just like, wow. And, and the message around it was, Zach says, we all, like we, we live and we fear dying. He's like, but we actually have no idea what happens when we, when we die. Maybe we actually only start living when we die. You know, maybe there's this whole other world out there that uh, is just kind of waiting for us. And this is, this is the sort of pathway to get there. And I was like, wow, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> oh, well, that's a good time for me to tell you a little story. Can I tell you the story of the toad? Please do. <laughs> okay. All right. So in the Sonoran Desert lives a toad called Bufo alvarius. And Cilius Alvarius is what they call it now. And this toad, for nine months of the year, bakes under the ground. It basically hibernates. So imagine it's underground and it's sleeping. And what it's doing is it's brewing a very special concoction in these parotid glands behind its eyes. And the frequency at which it's baking is the same frequency of the earth. So imagine that nine months. Frequency in tune with that of the earth. Then all the information that's traveling down as light from the sun is also baking together. So that concoction of this medicine that sits here is the frequency of the earth together with all the information coming from the sun over nine months. Then it rains. The monsoon season comes. These folks come, these toads come out to greet, and people from different tribes out there will go out and at night time they go and they find these toads and they sing to them and then they collect them and they gently squeeze the glands and this venom is pushed out onto a glass sheet and then dried as a wax and that in that concoction that venom is a whole bunch of tryptamines 
alkaloids, anti-inflammatories, and then the God molecule, which is 5-MeO-DMT. Now, our bodies produce 5-MeO-DMT naturally. <clears throat> we hold that compound in our lungs and in our pineal gland. When we're born and we come out of our mother's womb and we take that first breath of life, our lungs dump all of DMT into the system. And so we have our first DMT experience and our full emotional release. So that baby ah, is basically allowing all of the energy that's been compounded and accumulated from sitting in the womb, it's all like an opportunity to run and release. So DMT is what we experience as our gateway into the world. The next time that we experience it is when we transition. And the moment before you die, your body starts to release all of its DMT and you start to go into that DMT space and it's our transition and our gateway back to where we came from. So when we have this experience, now as an adult, we are having a rebirth. And so we die to come back to life so that we can then live. And that is the experience of the toad. Wow. I can't think of many other great ways to, to finish things off, but that, that's a, a lot to think about and beautiful. I was just wondering, but I, I do like asking like these sort of questions. Um, and I know you're a prolific reader. Um, what are two books that have kind of changed your kind of life and, and worldviews that you think other people might find interesting? Only two. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a loaded question, but... <laughs> yeah, it's a, I mean, wow, there's so many great books out there. Okay, so the two that really stick out for me, like, I, I always come back to The Alchemist. You know, I think the time when I read The Alchemist, it was like this first sort of moment of like, wow, this deep spiritual story interwoven into like this beautiful adventure. And it somehow always resonated with me. And I think so many people resonate with that book. So I would have to put The Alchemist on that list. And it's one of those books that you can reread again and again and again. You just take beautiful gems from it. And it's also one of the inspirations for why I'm going to Egypt in November. Um, and then the other one, Eckhart Tolle, but like The Power of Now, was one of those books that I kept picking up and I couldn't read it. I was like, I couldn't get past page one. COVID hits. I pick it up and suddenly it was like, oh my God, every single word just resonated, resonated, resonated. And I think that is the ultimate medicine is that if you are struggling with anything, just stay present. Come back to the present moment. Stop worrying about the future. Stop dragging the past with you. Just be here now. And if we can get that right, we can solve so many of our problems that live in our head. That's so great, but it's so interesting that you said that. It's amazing. like you can read a book and depending on where you are in your life at that moment, like it can either have this amazing impact on you or you can be like, Oh yeah, no, I didn't really get that. What's everyone talking about? I'm busy reading the sequel, I guess, to the surrender experiments, which we've both read called the untethered soul. Right. Mm. I think I've started the book 10 times. I'm not even kidding. And I like, I never got past chapter one. And I was like, yes, yeah, what's going on here? <laughs> and then recently I started it again. And chapter one, it was like every single word spoke to me. I was like, how did I not pick this up before? Like, where was I? You know what I mean? Like, I was just totally in a different plane. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, yeah. must have been. And it's just, yeah. it's so interesting. So we have to be conscious. I think sometimes I'm like, you know, when we're reading things, when we're doing things, okay, cool. What is my sort of state of mind, um, et cetera. So, so I'm glad that, uh, <laughs> that I'm not the only one that sort of experiences those, those having to reread the, the first page 20 times, but <laughs> so. Yeah. And just, and just, to, just to quickly tie onto that before we, before we close up is it's like everything in our life, right? You know, they say like when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. It's like when you are at the right vibration to receive information from a certain book, suddenly the book becomes easy to read. 
It's the same thing with our relationships. It's the same thing with our opportunities and our careers. And so you just need to be aware. Don't force it. Don't push it because it will happen as soon as you are vibrating at the right frequency. And when it does happen and it's for you, it will feel easy. And I think that's also another thing to change in life. We are so used to like building and forcing and hustling and grinding. And what are we doing? We're like hurting ourselves. When actually the life experience is, hey, what if we just got into the river of this beautiful flow of life that's going one way and let's go with it and let's enjoy it. So. Absolutely. Very well said. Just uh, go with the flow at um, every opportunity if you can. So, but what is something that you are like really excited about for the future? Um, and uh, where can people get in touch with you if they want to sort of find out more? Mm. I'm really excited about the community we're building here. And I'm really excited about being part of this wave of change. There's a lot of wonderful people really starting to like step into their powers with their gifts. And I'm excited about collaborating with as many people with their gifts, just for the betterment of all of us, right? For us all just to enjoy each other's gifts and, you know, help each other. So that's the excitement. And to get hold of us, um, Earth Medicines Miami on Instagram, feel free to reach out, drop a message, just follow us. Um, and that, yeah, that'll be the best place to start. And the final question, but what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Ah, it's like, can we really just fully express ourselves? Like, if we're going to do something, let's fucking go for it. You know what I mean? Like, let's stop holding back. Let's stop playing half the game. Let's just, fuck, let's just go. Let's just see what this experience is really about. Let's free ourselves. Let's liberate ourselves. And let's just, let's create real magic in the world. And I think it's starting to happen. So that for me is it. Just untether yourself and let's just go. I seriously love that. And when it comes to you, that's my like experience of you as a, as a friend, you know, someone that's known you like 20 years now, you know, well, no, Jeepers, 25 it's years. Longer, it's yeah. nice long. <laughs> I forget how old we are, but, <laughs> but seriously, man, I just wanted to say it's, it's always such a pleasure, but uh, you have a, a special energy about you and it's, beautiful being around you and it's it's an honor to be your friend and like i said like during the podcast like i'm I'm like just proud that you know of what you're doing but also proud that we are buddies and just love all the things that we've experienced together it's been wow man it's been such a journey you know and and uh, there's so much more to go uh, so i just i'm really excited about what you're doing i think you are by far the right person to be doing what you're doing and whoever comes into your presence and is helped by you I know they are going to feel like a different person once they once you have sort of you know finished the experience with them and it's not just you know doing say plant medicine but it's just like when people are in your presence, I think that's, that's how you make people feel. So thanks for always being a high energy person, because I know it can actually be really taxing on people too, you know? Um, and I'm just thankful that, that we are in each other's lives, brother. So once again, just such a lack of chats. Thank you so much, man. Oh, thank you so much. Really. That, that makes me feel so good to hear. So thank you for expressing that. It means the world to me. Um, Honored to be your friend, brother. And thank you so much again for having me here today. Pleasure, my boy.